Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome. Good evening. I am uh, Luis Macenta, the, the, I'm the director of ANGAR, and uh, this is the third online presentation of the Braiding Friction program. Braiding Friction is the response that uh, the project Biofriction, the reaction that the project Biofriction uh, decided uh, uh, in front of the COVID-19 pandemic. The pandemic, uh, as you can imagine, uh, changed the plans of the project, and uh, this structure of braiding friction in working groups was uh, the response, the reaction of the project to that situation. As mentioned, uh, braiding friction is a program of the project Biofriction. Biofriction is a research project funded by the Creative Europe program of the EU. The project was uh, was conceived and is being developed by BioArt Society in Helsinki, Kershnikova in Ljubljana, Cultivamos Cultura in Lisbon, and us, Angar, in, uh, in Barcelona. I want to mention that the project has also two associated partners, and I want to do it because they are active associated partners. They are really involved uh, in different ways in the project. Those are Anthropo, uh, and also the Institute for Research in Biomedicine in Barcelona. Breaking friction, this, this response to the pandemic from the biofriction side, is organized in four working groups. And uh, the one speaking today, it's the group uh, organized, coordinated from ANGAR, uh, and it's called Phageologies. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite hard to say this word. I, I, I hope by the end of this session, I know how to pronounce it. Phage Logist. The members of the group are the following. Kindlab. Kindlab is an interdisciplinary hub in the San Siro neighborhood in Milan, which will be run by multiple subjects, among those Madalena Fregnito and Zoe Romano. And today, uh, Madalena and Zoe are here with us. Power Make Us Sick is also a member of this group. Uh, Power Make Us Sick is a creative research project focusing on autonom autonomous healthcare practices and networks from a feminist perspective. Also a member of the group is Steve Kurtz. Steve Kurtz is Professor Emeritus of Art of the State University of New York. And he's a founding member of the Art and Theater Group Critical Art Ensemble. Another member of the group is Tony Gabaldon. Tony Gabaldon is a research professor at the Institute for Biomedical Research in Barcelona and also in the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And uh, another member of the group is Quimera Rosa, also present today. Uh, Quimera Rosa is a nomadic lab created in Barcelona in 2008 that researches and experiments on body technoscience and identities. And uh, coordinating this group, also a member of this group, is Laura Benitez Valero, who is also the director of the project Biofriction. Uh, Laura is a researcher and independent curator and her research connects philosophy, art, arts, and techno-science. Techno um, the structure of, the, of, of this presentation will be a short talk presentation by everyone in the group. And after that round of presentations, we will have a discussion amongst the group. And later on, we will open the discussion to anyone listening uh, the ones involved in, uh, in, uh, in uh, other working groups in braiding friction can join the Jitsi, but everyone uh, is uh, invited to join in the riot uh, chat uh, that it's, it's already on. And feel free to ask questions, comments. I will be attentive to the riot chat. So if you want to interact with us, I will be reading that all the time. Okay. So thanks everyone for being here. I mean, we have a lot to, to, to say, so I will take no more time. So I pass the mic to Laura.
Laura Benitez. Okay. Um, can you hear me properly? Yes. Yes. Super. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for the presentation, and thanks everyone for joining us today. Joining us today. Uh, joining us on Friday evening for some of us, and Friday morning from for some of you, and also for being so kind and and well active in in these uh, public presentations that uh, we are organizing within the, this program that it's called Braving Friction. I I want to also. Uh, thank to, to all the participants for being active, uh, for being here, and for making a super interesting uh, debates and conversations and the possibility of thinking together, uh, well, uh, real in a way. So um, I'm going to, to share my screen. I'm going to just to, to share with you a super brief general introduction to the group, to the topic so uh, you should be able to see my screen now. It's just, okay, a couple of images that uh, I want to, to share with you. So, uh, well, as you know, as Luis already says, uh, the, the, this working group, it has a quite, uh, let's say, tricky, at least in terms of pronunciation, mainly for the ones who are known uh, native English speakers, uh, for example, like me. Uh, but uh, the, the first thing is uh, why the name of the group, why this name, and, and what it means, phageologies, uh, such a tricky wordplay. And uh, as you can see Laura, here... Yes? Sorry to interrupt, we are not seeing your screen. No? No. You should. No, we are just seeing a blank as, as if you have covered your webcam with something, but we don't see the images. Uh, now no, we no. see. Now we see. Now. Okay. Now perfect. Yes? Yes, perfect. A okay. I mean, it's just, uh, it's, it's just uh, the image, so. But, um, well, what I was saying is that one, one, the first thing is, is to share with you why the name of the group, why phageologies, and, and why this uh, subtitle in a way, uh, such as alliances in the space of uh, necropolitics. So in terms of referring to the name of the group, um, the proposal is to, to use the figuration of the bacteriophage let's say, as the critical trigger to counter this notion of the virus, the virus, sorry, as an enemy to be defeated that's been so present and is so present in the media and in political narratives during the pandemic. So precisely because these narratives, uh, in a way, leaves aside the power of the viral agent, um, inverted commas, as a condition of possibility of uh, microbial evolution. No? So within the, the framework of, of a group that meets, uh, let's say, to think, to share about some questions and to share questions, to try to articulate questions together uh, related to necropolitics, we found it interesting how these entities, I'm going to use the term entities, <laughs> are in this kind of between not quite alive and not quite, quite deaf, and in a way are sometimes, uh, they are described as a kind of a dark force of uh, evolution. So uh, when we refer in general terms to necropolitics uh, within this, uh, working groups, um, we are referring to the exercise, uh, to exercise control over mortality and to define life as the deployment and manifestation of power. And uh, for us, it's really important that, uh, I mean, to, to, to remark, to point out that uh, within this pandemic, within the coronavirus or the, the pandemic itself is not simply as an epidemiological crisis, but a crisis of sovereignty. So 
for us, it was important to take this uh, figuration as a, as a trigger to think how in this uh, neoliberal context, in a way, we are forced to account for death and dying in a, let's say, in a kind of an era when, where a majority of people, of uh, human agents, non-human agents, uh, multiplicity of entities are pushed into precarious uh, living situations, conditions, or existence. For example, if uh, we are uh, thinking of uh, environmental struggle, for example. So what we've been uh, discussing within this, uh, let's say, uh, frame in terms of necropolitics is in a way uh, how life in a biopolitical frame is always already subjugated to and determined by the power of death. And as uh, our colleagues already remarked in the presentation of uh, non-living queerings, uh, they were mentioning uh, questions regarding the, the notion of crisis. And, and for example, who has the power of declaring a crisis? from whom it is a, it's a possibility to, to declare a crisis. Uh, some of them were pointing out that, uh, in a way, uh, capitalism itself is a permanent state of crisis. And also for us, within this uh, framework, it's important to, to think of neoliberalism as a permanent crisis in terms of sovereignty. So. Uh, we found interesting to, to take this figuration of, uh, of the bacteriophage as a possibility from which to think on questions such as the ones uh, I hope you can read here. Uh, for example, if we can rearticulate, I mean, given the circumstances, uh, repolitization of the malaise, um, or if, for example, um, if can we think of new models of accountability, how to confront suffering, uh, if are we able to confront some less than pleasant thoughts that emerge when we think about the pandemic crisis, environmental struggle and justice, or uh, what alliances can be woven in this context of precariousness, uh, life, death, as, as, uh, as I already said. Um, Malays. So we thought that uh, regarding the, the context, the conditions, and regarding the fact that we are privileged enough to have uh, time to, to meet, to discuss, and to share questions, we thought that it would be interesting to share concerns related to necropolitics. And also, um, let me say that uh, what we want to, to do today is to share some questions with you, to share some concerns, but of course we are not uh, giving a talk on necropolitics, uh, we are not answering uh, the questions, we are uh, sharing and we hope that this uh, debate and conversation can be a, a trigger to think together and 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 to meet uh, in this, uh, let's say, uh, uh, extended uh, body that is this kind of interfaces that are conditioning us right now. And uh, that's that's uh, the proposal to 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 think in terms of responsibility and also. Um, if we are uh, delegating, in a way, uh, all the necropolitical uh, decisions just to governments and, and some, let's say, for example, biomedical institutions or, or the politics as usual or, or to the articulation of some policies, then uh, what happens uh, also with us in terms of responsibility you know, to, to this uh, uh, possibility of, of giving a response as, as, an, as an entanglement. So uh, that's uh, my general introduction. So we can go with uh, the next one. Thank you so much. Thank you, Laura. So now, Tony, it's your turn. You ready? Yes. Uh, thank you, Luis. Can you hear me? Perfect. 
Yes, okay, so um, I'm a researcher, as, as it was introduced, working on a, on a public research institution. And when I was thinking about death um, in the context of these pandemics, I was doing so from a perspective of death, disease, virus, host, and, and how we can, you know, tackle these problems to, to, to reduce the number of deaths and, and the burden of disease uh, and so on. And with this mindset, I joined this, um, this group of debate uh, with uh, people with other different backgrounds than mine, artists, uh, activists, uh, thinkers, to discuss about necropolitics. And to be honest, uh, in the beginning, this term was very fuzzy for me, and I had to, to look it up to know exactly what we were going to be discussing about. And necropolitics is defined as the power to decide, I mean, to the use of political or social power to decide who may live or who may die. And this is, um, you know, a, a very harsh question. And, and it confronted me uh, with a reality which was in front of me all the time. And I was aware of it, but I was feeling kind of, in a way, disconnected. And, and all these discussions we have been having all this time uh, have made me think about, um, about the role of, uh, of public research institutions and, and public health system in this context of, of necro necropolitics. So from a scientific perspective, as I already said, we, we, we tend to, to, to look into the problems from, uh, from, from a perhaps very narrow perspective to try to solve them and to understand these complex that are in itself uh, very complex systems and, and very difficult to tackle. But, and then maybe solutions may be found uh, to these diseases uh, and so on. And, but then usually scientists, we lose track of how these solutions penetrate into society and the truth is that they penetrate they penetrate very badly most of the times for instance we know how to cure uh, tuberculosis or, or at least most of the cases and yet every year one million and a half uh, persons die every year for for tuberculosis so something is not working and if you look at the map of the incidence of tuberculosis for instance you see that poverty has to do with the likelihood of dying for this disease for which as a society uh, we have a solution in terms of the health system i think the health system is more used to be confronted uh, to the idea that resources are limited and care cannot be provided to everyone and and there has to be decisions to to see who can get this care. And this is called in medical terms, uh, triage, which is a term and, and an issue that we have also been discussing in this debate. So triage is, a, is, an, ethical, um, um, is an ethical problem, no? Because how to decide which person to treat when you cannot treat all of them? Because this may have implications of who's gonna survive and who's gonna die. And most of the medical protocols for, for triage uh, they are based on ethical uh, grounds and they try to use only uh, clinical um, criteria and be a way, trying to be neutral to other conditions such as, you know, the social condition or other uh, considerations that should not take place in that. But how this translates into reality is also another issue because decisions are taken by humans and, and, and the persons that take the decisions are the same persons that evaluate also uh, these parameters. And, and in this crisis, in the pandemic, we have seen and we have discussed this in our debates, how many of the problems with triads has come to the surface. Uh, like for instance, can age be used as a proxy for likelihood of surviving um, the disease or are we implementing some age discrimination in this sense? So there's many, many problems with, with these things. So these are just, uh, a couple of examples of things uh, we have discussed uh, uh, in this in this group, and I don't want to extend myself because my, my colleagues have also to to speak. But the the overall topic has been, you know, as as a society, can we um, can we find a way to be fair about uh, this? How net necropolitics is dealt is dealt with because it's happening. In, in any case, even is is mostly hidden. We don't see, we don't talk about it, but it's happening in uh, around the corner. 
So one of the things we discussed is that we need a language to talk about it. We need to be aware that this is happening. And as a society, we need to empower ourselves to, 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 to be in control of that, because otherwise the control will be in, in an unfair uh, system. So I think the, the, the life um, is a right uh, of human beings and should not be a privilege. So for me, this is a, it's a very important uh, problem. And, and I think this, these debates were a first step towards speaking out about these, these things. And I've been very happy to participate and thank you. Thank you, Tony. Um, now it's uh, the turn of Kim Lab. If you're ready, you can start. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Hello. Okay, so, he <laughs> so hello everyone, and thanks for inviting us uh, uh, to this public talk, but mostly into the Thinking Together um, research group we were part of during this month of pandemic. So I am Madalena and uh, I'm here with Zoe, which will show you some, a couple of diagrams we were working on during uh, last days. And uh, I hope it will work unless uh, she will show to you uh, the diagrams at the end of the, our presentation. So together with Zoe, during last year, we have activated and written about groups organizing healthcare provision that aren't considered as uh, standards by the public service and the length through which we watch to these practices is uh, um, meaning how and when some type of uh, let's say technical innovation can foster communities to share social reproduction among participants uh, this research of course has meant also to dig into the processes of privatization of care provision by capital interest one that uh, are becoming for instance, through platform devices and data grabbing, the core business model of most of uh, the big tech companies nowadays. Um, when COVID came and consequently when this reflective um, group process started, we had, me and Zer, the opportunity to better focus on the necropolitics aspects of care. Um, but before of that, let's start by clarifying what we mean by care. So um, we would like to, to take in account Maria Puig de la Balacasa definition of care, which by uh, modifying Toronto's definition states that care is everything that is done um, to maintain, continue and repair the world so that all can live in it as well as possible. And by quoting this definition of care, um, what we are pushed to understand is that uh, if we all are dependent, consequently we all are involved within specific um, caring activities which define who lives and who does not, and obviously how. In this sense, care um, seems to us a multidimensional matrix of uh, power relation involving social and ecological aspects. So in this terrain of conflict and oppression, which makes and regenerates not all lives, as I was saying before, um, since it has become more explicit in these days by tightening uh, um, the boundaries around what and who is worth it to survive, um, this is the reason why um, we have started to explore how a radical comprehension of the conflictual character of care is essential to move care function, let's say, far from being the handmade of capital reproduction's priorities and toward a common purpose of making and regenerating um, all and better life. Um, in fact, we, we have all experienced you now all this uh, new visibility of care during the pandemic, the centrality of care in all debates, TV shows and mainstream media. But uh, um, this uh, centrality has better revealed what and who is taken care of uh, and what and who is let die, hurt and oppressed. In a word, the necropolitical ethics behind the capitalistic care system provision, the capitalistic one. Um, another aspect which comes from uh, the 
common discussion we had in the is the, is the um, let's say the regional variability of this understanding, meaning the profound discrepancies of care provisions that occur among our different countries of origin, no? in specific between uh, in this group, between America and Europe, uh, precisely Italy from where we come from. So different country from which we are experiencing very different models of care, capitalistic models of care. From our perspective, these uh, differences gave to us the possibility to better address health care as a universal right. Um, to face the role of general taxation in order to fund the uh, public health care system, and also to better, let's say, unveil the role of what we can call the urgency, the need of new institution, both by analyzing contemporary one's limits and by uh, prefiguring the possible uh, relations among public sector and autonomous practices of health and care distribution we are active in, although this can be seen for someone has a contradiction. Um, for instance, we have questioned together whether hospital triage is more than the medical language of Mexico politics, and we have discovered how a state of emergency is actually not performing new ethics, rather it's showing to us, more explicitly, the overall ethics uh, uh, reality. Um, so therefore, emergency is just giving more visibility to the general social condition in non-emergency times. It is clear, though, that to, to everyone know that elderly, poor, blacks, women, disabled people are part of a second or better a third class which becomes just more explicitly sacrificial when the medical language bursts through the triage um, selection of lives. No? So this disclosure happens both into the public and the private sector but with different languages and tools. The first process of life care and selection hides behind a difficult bureaucratic language which unveils the ethics of our social contract, I say like that, while the second one hides behind a simple economic access tool, for instance, insurances, which unveil um, the ethics of uh, uh, the marketization of life. Ho however, both are um, drawing an agreement on values of care, meaning on life and death, accessibility and acceptance, which are poorly democratized. Again, this new visibility allows us to explore the paradoxes, the ambiguities and the hierarchies of care and to read more clearly the historical conflict between uh, divergent care practices. And, and models. And in this sense, also the debate around uh, essential worker has shown the same boundaries. No? For instance, uh, as uh, um, the activist and writer Heather Marsh writes on her uh, Blinding Cows book, all of us. Uh, um, she says, all of uh, the work that benefits society has been or could easily be unpaid, while pay is only required for work that is harmful to, to society. You know? So people are paid to kill people, people are not paid to give birth. In this sense, what the pandemic has revealed is nothing new. Social and ecological reproduction tasks have never been uh, acknowledged as work and have been ascribed to the sphere of uh, the natural or natural resources available for um, the appropriation um, has to legitimize an, an immense extortion of wealth. Let's say essential workers for both for governments and markets are just disposal bodies. Um, trying to reverse this priority, which is which was uh, part of uh, the, 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 the conversation within the group and um, among me and, and Zoe, uh, um, priority which are at the origins of a structural life emergency, uh, let's say that our all life 
the urgency is linked to our ability of collectivizing the decision on what is essential and for whom, no? And this is for us a crucial political issue, which is still um, delegated to um, on too few <laughs> governors, no? So the democratization of this uh, decision, which uncovered the political character of care, is becoming nowadays, for, from our perspective, the higher terrain of conflict. So in this sense, care is nothing nice, um, natural or maternal, but uh, um, space of conflict. No, to fight for and with care means supporting the struggles for uh, universal access to public health, wealth, schools, the struggle against police violence, government's violence, the struggle against the um, exploitation of communities, and so on. In a word, the fight against profit accumulation and for the redistribution. Um, of the limited uh, resources of the planet. No? To conclude, questioning what is essential and what is not, and for whom, of course, hides for us a complex issue, which highlights the conflict at stake around different models of care we are into. Um, and indeed, answering to this question implies to collectively rethink both um, on what can still be produced and what can no longer be produced by digging on our necessities and desire, which is a great point, and on what we want to continue reproducing and what is no longer worth reproducing. So answering requires a difficult collective reflection on what is no longer worth caring or keeping alive in order to uh, improve the same condition of life. A question that um, in our previous meeting, in our um, research group, we have somehow named as a process of common in eco-politics. Zoe, up to you. Yes, so um, as we cannot keep being stuck in this crisis, as we know, as Donna Haraway said, that capitalism and critique of capitalism makes us stupid in a particular way because it makes us believe that there's nothing else, there's no other possible world to live in. We want to uh, share a kind of horizon which are pointing at and in which we could uh, uh, like to, we, we would like to keep interactive with all of you. It's an horizon of, of insurrection which refuses uh, the paralysis, this paralysis of critique that sometimes brings. So we call this uh, symbiopolitics, uh, borrowing the word from Stefan Almerich, uh, which is in, in his biology book uh, called The Alien Ocean. He defines as the governance of relations among entangled living things. So in which way we can create a system of reproduction or more than human planet, we can do it only creating more awareness around the entanglement of living things, especially starting from the micro world. We have the chance now to move from a crisis to a change, starting from what already is happening in various communities around the world, who are creating new practices and redefine life and death, and as two visible crucial aspects of our complex inhabiting the world. So we believe we cannot be stuck in only in our communities. Of course, we, those allow us to stay close to who is similar to us, but we need to invade society as a place where we can meet who is different from us. So together we need to define what is essential work and how we come to preserve society as a public space where we build new institutions based on a more symbiotic vision of the world. So there is no time now to explore this in details, but we can exchange on how to cultivate the arts of living on a damaged planet in the next month together. Thank you. Hey. Thank you, Madalena and Zoe. Uh, now is the turn of Steve Kurtz. Are you ready? I'm ready. Yeah, I'm good. Okay. Sound perfect. Go on, please. Okay, fantastic. So, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to take a few minutes just to riff on, um, I guess, a very contemporary topic, and that's the necropolitics of our current uprising here in the U.S. and rapidly spreading elsewhere. 
Um, of course, the place to start is with the video of George Floyd being murdered. Uh, it's a, it's quite an interesting viewing, I think, um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one that it it shows a murder. It shows what minorities and people of color have been saying have been going on for decades and it used to be even worse if we go back more than decades and there it is right for everyone to see in all its sadistic glory a kind of necropolitics that is of the most disgraceful variety but it shows something else that's even more significant here that because we've had tapes of black men being murdered before. This isn't a new site, right? Um, but this one is particularly interesting because the police know there are witnesses watching this murder, and they also know that people are filming it, right? That it's all being caught on camera. And what this really comes to mean then is they feel, police that is, that they can murder someone in plain sight with witnesses, put it on camera, and that they should still be able to get away with it. That murder is part of their sovereign mission. And I think that's what finally struck people when they saw it to push them, even in a time of COVID, that something really has to be done this time. That uh, the necropolitics that usually is deep in the darkness of invisibility and latency was so apparent and so monstrous that it just could no longer be ignored. Now, once that starts, as we know for uprisings, if they are to really catch fire, and I don't mean this in, in any kind of pun or anything, um, looting has to go with it, right? That there has to be violence. There has to be violence of a pretty horrific variety, right? And, you know, certainly there's more police violence. There's uh, rioters versus police violence. And um, then there is what comes with the looting. And this is a very unfortunate circumstance that uh, people in this case are killed, oftentimes just for defending their store. Um, it's not a necropolitics that we could say is just in any way, but I am gonna say that it's a necropolitics that's acceptable, right? And we'll come back to that particular point in just a moment. All right. so. We have another class of people being killed. And in some ways it has to be because if this doesn't happen, if the violence does not occur, the media isn't gonna cover it. And it can be sanitized and covered up and pushed back into latency. That will be the fate of that uprising. If you wanna bring it into visibility, um, this kind of unfortunate byproduct is necessary. Now, the lucky thing in this particular version is it seems that the vast majority has managed to separate the protesters regarding the necropolitics of race relations from the looters, that these things were two different enterprises. And that's basically a little bit new as, as well. And then finally, there's a very strange development that has occurred and I hope this will link into PMS's presentation. And that is that all of the protesters going out on the street gave justification, and, and it may not um, be cor correct, and it certainly wasn't intentional on the part of the protesters, but it gave cover for the right and conservative, particularly Trump conservatives, to say, well, they can go out on the street and that's not a problem, so can I. And that made this kind of dialectical fuel 
of more and more people saying, COVID, well, we can just pretend like it doesn't exist. And so we have a lot, on top of that, lots of young people going out, and in this case, just to have a good time and who can blame them. But what all of this activity does, and we also should probably include the president's super spreader rallies, but what this has the effect of doing is almost the opposite of what the uprising is trying to do, right? The uprising is trying to make an environment that is habitable for people of color. But then with this explosion of we're going to ignore the COVID rules, what we're actually doing at this particular point, and like I said, it's this is not an intentional thing. I, on, I don't think on anyone's part, but it it is the byproduct is that since people of color do not have equal access to health care, it's killing more of them. What we're doing is upping the death rate for people of color. And like I said, so this is just some kind of strange event <laughs> that is is happening and and it's um it's horribly ironic but it's it's very difficult to describe because there's not simple causalities there there's no real intentionality involved but it's happening and you know this too much like the video of George Floyd being murdered shows the depth of institutionalized racism that we have in the US and have always had since its inception. So where does that leave us? Well, there, <laughs> there is perhaps an, an upside to all of this. And one is that I, I think we are trying to develop a new biopolitics and that is how do we make an environment that is habitable for all people? And I think that the George Floyd video has become a transcendental signifier of sorts, where it doesn't just represent the murder of a black man. It represents much more. It represents all of the institutionalized racism that is in our medical structure, that is in environmental policy, right? That is an economic inequality, that is in the legal system. I mean, all of it has finally come together in the full mesh of this necropolitics is visible and it, it won't stay visible for long, but right at this particular time, and particularly because of that video, it's all very clear to anyone who is paying attention. The other point that I'd like to make, and this is where we come back to acceptability. Why is it acceptable that we're going to lose some, some lives during this uprising? Right. Um, it seems what's trying to happen is an emergence of a new criteria for necropolitical policy, right? The old one, as Zoe and, and Magdalena have, have just uh, pointed out, and if you allow me to be reductive, uh, is, is basically necropolitics is decided on what's most profitable for the wealthiest classes. <clears throat> That's pretty much how it's set in the time of neoliberalism in its most predatory form. I think that emerging from the ground up is people saying, you know what, there really needs to be a new criteria for how necropolitics is being set, that there needs to be a different form of acceptability, not just one that's based in profits. Now, what that is, I'm not exactly sure. And this is something that I hope we can talk about and, uh, and question and debate. Is, is what is the new criterion for acceptability. And one of the experiments that 
it's been tried before that I think is, is more um, concretely representative of this new criterion is that both Atlanta and Seattle attempted to make a zone, to make an environment in which it was completely uninhabitable for police. That's an interesting development. That's a new, a, a new kind of necropolitics of how do we make environments uninhabitable, but in a productive way, in a positive way, instead of a horrific and monstrous way, which is normally what we see within the frame of neoliberalism. So that's my time. And like I said, it, I, I hope it's more questions than answers. And I'm going to turn it back over to Luis for further moderation. Thank you, Steve. Um, OK, so now uh, is the turn of our make a seek. If you're ready, you can start. Hey, thanks. Um, yeah, this has been a great discussion. Um, <clears throat> So Luis already kind of introduced the collective a bit, so I'll just go right into it. Um, we just wanted to respond to what you said really briefly, and you know we appreciate everything that was just mentioned, but I think maybe this is a semantic point, but it's important to make clear that looting isn't violence, right? Like property itself in a world filled with such inequality as we have it, that is violence. Like looting is revenge and looting is justice. And we value black lives over property. The loss of a life is important. No one's going to have a memorial for a window or I would hope that they wouldn't anyway. And well-meaning white liberals believing that property is more important or even comparable to black lives is a big part of what keeps us stuck in the place that we are today. So anyway, um, as part of this working group on necropolitics, we felt it was important to do what we could to center conversations about systemic racism and more importantly, or, you know, more particularly anti-blackness. And there's like a lot that we could cover, but we wanted to focus on anti-blackness in the medical system as something that we could discuss. Um, just want to also be clear that we see self-defense and fighting back as crucial elements of community health and resilience. And we support all those fighting on the ground or taking care of the loved ones right now and want to remember to think about them too, if they can't be here. Um, so I'm going to talk about two different case studies of, that seem important or relevant to this discussion. Then we're going to talk about some sort of like basic statistics um, around racial bias in the medical system in the US, touch on some of what that might look like in Europe as well, and then come back to talking about um, COVID. and um, racism and COVID response, and then close with some closing thoughts. So um, let me see here. Sorry, give me a second. I'm bad at technology and I want to show a picture. <clears throat> okay, this is from, I'm showing an image from um, a protest against a monument to J. Marianne Sims in uh, New York City. So, um, Annika, Lucy, and Betsy are the only three of a dozen enslaved women named by J. Marion Sims in the notes he kept during the barbaric surgical experiments performed on them. Annika Westcott, whose real name or name she called herself, will never know, alone endured 30 excruciating surgeries without anesthesia. Sims would go on to treat white women of fistula with the findings of his experimentation, but this time with anesthesia. Anesthesia wasn't used on the female slaves for, as Sims put it in his own words, quote, black women don't feel pain, end quote. The failure to recognize black pain persists today where a 2016 study found that in the United States, black patients are about half as likely to receive opioids and other pain medications given, to this, given the same level of pain and other factors being accounted for. As of early July 2020, at least three monuments to Sims still stand in Columbia, South Carolina, Montgomery, Alabama, and um, New York City. 
One second. Okay, this is another image from the Tuskegee experiments. Between 1946 and 48, medical doctors deliberately infected at least 1,500 otherwise healthy Guatemalan people, including orphans as young as nine, soldiers, prostitutes, prisoners, and psychiatric patients with syphilis and other sexually transmitted diseases without the informed consent of the subjects. These experiments were funded by the U.S. National Institute of Health and led by John Charles Cutler, who was also lead on the Terahuate prison experiments from 43 to 44, and in, in the later stages of the Tuskegee experiments, which overall lasted from 32 to 72. Cutler would go on to become the Assistant Surgeon General of the Public Health Service in 1958 in the US. In Tuskegee, researchers aimed to observe the natural progression of untreated syphilis in rural African-American men under the guise of receiving free healthcare from the state. None of the infected men were ever told they had the disease by their medical providers. Even after penicillin became an effective and widespread treatment, these scientists also withheld information about the cure from the subjects, and they were prevented from accessing syphilis treatment programs available to other residents in their area. In The Deadly Deception, Cutler states, it, quote, it was important that they were supposedly untreated, and it would be undesirable to go ahead and use large amounts of penicillin to treat the disease because it would interfere with the study, end quote. The Tuskegee experiments were only terminated after whistleblower Peter Buxton leaked information about, about it to media outlets in 1972 after many in the study had died or passed on illness to their children and loved ones. None of this should be surprising as the foundation of Western medicine was only made possible by the silencing of long-held healing traditions throughout Europe in the form of the genocide of so-called witches and healers. When other healing practices were found in colonized places, mm. those have been deemed some kind of woo or quack or otherwise seen as not real. They are seen this way un until those long-standing traditions can be monetized by white people and turned into luxury alternatives to the prison hospital. Okay, so now we're gonna bring it to the present and we wanted to bring up implicit and direct racial bias in the US and European healthcare systems. Um, earlier, Tony was speaking on triage and how questions of discrimination have come up during COVID because of you know, making decisions about who lives and dies through Corona and it's related to implicit bias, but implicit bias has been happening in medicine for a freaking long time. <laughs> Um, and it's when doctors and medical professionals embody views about minorities of which they're not consciously aware, but affect their actions and decision making towards patients care. So obviously there is also direct racial discrimination and racism within the medical system, but both can be seen in some statistics that we'll share now. Um, the first is that black patients in the U.S. are less likely than white patients to be given appropriate cardiac care, to receive kidney dialysis or transplants, or to receive the best treatments for stroke cancer or HIV AIDS. And they're more likely to have limbs amputated than white patients who have similar conditions. And the second statistic that we'll share is that African American, Native American, and Alaskan Native women are about three times more likely to die from causes related to pregnancy compared to white women. It's also in the United States. Uh, and the third statistic from the states that we'll share is in 2015, there was a survey and 34% of black trans people reported transphobic mistreatment while seeking medical care and 40% had been unable to access medical care because they could not afford it. So, Many of our statistics that we found during researching this comes from the US and there's not so much time, but we wanted to share one study that speaks to this um, in Europe as well, implicit bias. And, the, and one that we found was on end stage renal disease, which demonstrated that black and Asian patients were about half as likely to receive a kidney transplant as white, pa as white patients in Europe. So this kind of, drew some conclusions that like, even if the healthcare system is doing better in most parts of Europe than in the States because it, of it being generally public healthcare systems in Europe, 
They're still dependent on a long history of colonial violence, which rears its ugly head today in the form of the border. So if we look to a camp like uh, Moria and Lesbos, Greece, we can see that 40% of the population there are children. And at the clinics, uh, in, there's only a few clinics there and there's always queues for hours. Um, in the past five months, there's been no reliable electricity. And in terms of Corona, there's been barely any measures in place to avoid the spread of the virus in the camp besides very strict lockdowns enforced by police violently with tear gas, um, et cetera, but not offering masks or space for physical distancing or clean water. Um, and aid has been extremely limited to the lockdown restrictions. So it's important to remember that the dangers refugees are fleeing didn't arise out of nowhere. They're the result of centuries of colonialism and imperialism in the global south. Um, an injustice that the U.S. and European nations are still benefiting from today. So clearly there's a pressure to keep things as they are, otherwise we wouldn't be keeping people in cages. All right, I hope everyone can hear me. I'm having some issue with my internet connection, so just type in the chat if you can't hear me. No, we can hear you okay. Okay, yep. good. Thank you. So here in the United States, where I am right now, I'm seeing that Black and Indigenous people have disproportionately suffered the worst effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is because, like we talked about, systemic racism perpetuated or enabled by the state has designated marginalized people as disposable. We can see this in the many barriers to medical care that have existed since long before the pandemic and in the lack of hospitals and other health resources in low-income neighborhoods where most residents are people of color, as well as in rural areas, including on indigenous reservations. Undocumented immigrants often risk getting reported to immigration policing agencies if they seek medical care, and many also risk retaliation from employers if they take time off work when they're sick. Environmental racism places working class people of color at higher risk for chronic respiratory and cardiovascular conditions caused by pollution. Since experiencing racism is traumatizing, particularly when combined with the violence of patriarchy, homophobia, and transphobia, Black women in particular experience higher rates of stress-related chronic illness, many of which place them at higher risk for COVID-19. We've talked a lot about implicit bias and when, like we've said, when those prejudices inform the way that medical supplies are allocated in a shortage like the ones going on here, this deprioritization and dehumanization that people of color face in the medical system is deadly. We talked about also COVID-19 exposure is one of the many risks that those participating in the ongoing uprising against the white supremacist police state have taken on. While research is indicating now that the chance of infection is pretty relatively low at the outdoor protests themselves, the effect of the pandemic in jails and prisons means that anyone arrested will almost certainly be exposed. And since incarcerated people are already treated as one of the most disposable populations, and since withholding medical care is already used as a punishment in jails and prisons, the prisons have just turned into a COVID-19 hellscape and that makes that you know, situation is one of the things that makes a really good case for abolishing the prison system. We put together a short like PDF handout with some of the studies that we referenced, some more information about these topics and a little bit more about the work that we do and some of our other writing. So I can and share that with you as soon as I figure out what the best way to send that out would be. And I think it is all I have to say for a very short introduction to a topic that covers centuries and centuries of injustice and oppression. And I hope that we can continue to center the stuff that we've talked about as we look at the various effects of COVID-19, the way that governments have responded to that. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, so now it's the time of uh, for Kimera Rosa. This is the last uh, presentation, and then we move on to the discussion. Kimera, are you ready? Yes. Here we are. Yes, we are. Can you hear us? Hi, everybody. Yeah. So first, thank you for this opportunity for this meeting because we will present and um, think uh, since a project that we developed in Anger mainly. Uh, that is about another virus. And uh, for us, the opportunity is to think together because we will talk about uh, health, not only like a scientific topic, but the relationship between ecopolitics and minorities, between silence and death, between knowledge and health. Mm -hmm and life, mm -hmm. uh, and it was like in these times of physical distanciation that become a social one, a way to think together. So thank you for this. Um, mm -hmm. It's quite triggering to do it uh, with computers, but we are trying to. We are also lost the two last sessions, so we will improvise a little bit in days mm -hmm. of this project. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, no, we were lost in the last part of the group, mm -hmm. so um, I was thinking, well, no, thank you to all the group, but yeah. for me it was very inspiring, mm -hmm. all the question and the, that we were um, reading, and um, I don't know, in the, in the um, well, during the, the first session, I, um, I was thinking all the time in one question, and, was, and we will talk about mm. during the, some session, about how, where, and, and with who want to die, no? Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, it's a question. <laughs> yes, yeah. no? Uh, I think uh, today, like still, we have more questions than answers. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, for us, it was very important when we were working with this other virus, that is HPV, mm -hmm. to learn about HIV mm -hmm. for activism, for mm -hmm. arts, for this situation where minorities uh, well, uh, uh, doesn't have access to health system <coughs> and the responsibility mm -hmm. of these communities. Hmm. was to work together and to be considered not only like uh, patients of health system but like users and so experts yeah. because when you are living with the virus you know a lot of things <coughs> and mostly when you are dealing with community uh, ability when you, knowledge is sharing when knowledge is transdisciplinary perspective like in this project uh, in Angar, we were working, dealing with biomedical research, mm -hmm. with community groups uh, of people who don't have access to health system for reason of sexual identity, for gender uh, identity, for um, no have papers, Disability. disabilities, mm -hmm. and have a very conflictual situation with the institutional health system. And what we learn together and its information and care and sharing knowledge mm -hmm. is the base of a good health system. Because if not, you don't go, you don't go to a system, you don't know what you have, mm -hmm. you have a lot of uh, taboo if in case of sexual disease. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, we want to think a little bit of what can we learn about um, other virus and other response ability to virus, mm. like in the case of AIDS or HPV, mm. but also in case of countries that are not in Western uh, situation, <laughs> like <laughs> the odds, what Membe is talking about a lot, about the universal right to breathe mm. and the capacity of Africa, for example, to give a good response to 
to this virus, uh, to coronavirus, because from uh, Western countries, they say, oh, this will be a mess for Africa, and it's not, because they, they have learned a lot about a lot of uh, pandemics, and it's also about what happened in Africa with HIV, about patents, and how they deal with this, how they learn with this, and how now, for example, they are in a lot of countries able to have a test for one dollar. <laughs> that we are not in this situation in Western countries. Yeah. So it's a lot about these questions, no? mm -hmm. about minorities, but not uh, like in dollars uh, meaning, no, not about number, because yeah. we are majority. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no it's uh, to the, the, the idea of, uh, con ¿cómo se dice contagio? Contagion. Yeah, contagion. Yeah. Contagion. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, we take this idea about the uh, activists from NACTAP and mm -hmm. da And, bueno, uh, a ver. yeah, and we were talking about this difference about uh, social distance and physical distance mm -hmm. and uh, how the virus is is working in everyday life and yeah. uh, mm, um, so this idea about the uh, in contra uh, con, uh, con, sí, contraposition um, oh, well, uh, in, see, or in confrontation uh, with the idea of the Videos like uh, something bad, mm -hmm. so I think we we can learn a lot mm -hmm. about this mm -hmm. this virus, no? Because the virus is all and uh, and it's part of our ecosystem, yeah. no? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's also I think because we, we are talking about Membe because we are talking about necropolis, <laughs> <laughs> but Membe in the last text about uh, the universal right to breathe. I don't like the right pronunciation. Uh, talk about uh, we have to live with uh, with other than humans, and virus mm -hmm. are part of this other than humans. Mm -hmm. But it's not about uh, a war against virus, mm -hmm. but how we can live with, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, and so it's very different when you are in a situation where the only information is you have to put a mask, you don't have to put a mask. Now you have to come back to the house, uh, to home, and after that, there is no information. It's only like orders that you can't uh, manage collectively, no? And you can't manage in a very more knowledge situation. So I think it's very important to reverse and to put else like and care, mm. like community and horizontal system, mm. because uh, it's more knowledge. Mm. And also, it's more of an opportunity to um, look for solutions for minorities who don't have access to this situation. Mm. And we are in the necropolitic situation. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Would you like uh -huh. to, to, to add something else? Or no? Because if not, I'm going to. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So we are more questions. Like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. We are, sorry. Are, no, go on, go on, Laura, please. No, I just wanted to, I, are we still sharing our screen? No, okay. Not anymore, it's okay now. Okay, okay, thanks so much. Okay, well, as you can see, uh, I have the pleasure of being here in, let's say, in person together with Jimena Rosa. So my pleasure. Uh, thanks so much to everyone for the presentations. Uh, I just want to take the opportunity to remind, uh, mainly after Power Makes a Sick presentation and, and because we are here together with Kimera Rosa and, and they are part of the working group, that uh, the, the critical review that uh, the Gynet banks 
did uh, on the history of gynecology with the anarchic land project uh, by Tao Kinki and 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 the the, the project of the gynec banks Pech Blenda. I just want to remind that their project, their work, the ways of doing are the seed of biofriction. If we are here today, if we are, you know, like having this uh, this uh, braving friction activity is is because of the gynepunks, is because of um, of uh, Petblenda, is because of uh, some other nodes of bacteria, and also because of uh, Chimera Rosa, because they were all together working in the, let's uh, say, a framework of a project that was called Prototipome and was about open health and, and yeah, open science. Well, let's say, to, yeah, like uh, the importance to pay attention to what are the material conditions of knowledge production, who has access to it, uh, what, which are the presences, the absences, and the commitment, uh, necessity, and responsibility, precisely, of uh, reviewing in a critical terms the material conditions of knowledge production, for example, uh, with our colonial background and, and the systemic and structural violence uh, based uh, you know, on the oppressions. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I just want to mention that yeah. because I think that it's quite important. Uh, these kind of works are the seed and the condition of possibility of biofriction. And for that reason, uh, we remarked that uh, in biofriction, we are trying to to work from a uh, trans hack feminist uh, methods in terms of yeah. commitment. Mm -hmm. So I just want to mention that. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> no, thanks to you. <laughs> okay, please. So thank you all. And um, you all mentioned in your thoughts the, the, the need to, to discuss, to, to have uh, to have um, questions to each other. So my first thing to say, I mean, please go on. I'm sure that some of you uh, have something to comment or say on, uh, on uh, someone else's presentation. Otherwise, I will do it. But please go first. So could I respond to PMS? Please. Um, well, I, I just wanted to say that uh, if we're going to talk about looting, um, I wasn't talking about property. I was talking about the necropolitics of looting. That means people who are being killed in the act of looting. Now, we have the George Floyd video, but Fox News has their video, too. And it's of a woman being beaten to death in the street so people could enter her store and steal all the stuff in it. Now, you can call me a liberal, but I will never put murder, just flat-out horrific murder, into the realm of justice. It just doesn't go in that category. However, and as I've said in our discussion group, for the uprising to occur, and I support the uprising, I'm going to find that murder to be acceptable. And this is why I say the question of acceptability is such a difficult one, because it puts us in really difficult position in terms of discussing who should be alive who should be dead. And this is one of those real situations. The property is, I agree, completely insignificant, although I am a little broken up that the Minneapolis Black Business District is kind of burnt to the ground and um, there is somewhat now of an economic crisis which is going to knock on to a crisis in care, right? That destruction of property can have in effect, other than property was destroyed. Uh, but, the, but the real concern for this discussion, though, is the discussion of murder and can it be just? And as we've said in the discussion group, at least I've argued, I don't believe in just wars. I don't believe in just murders. And if you want to put me in the <laughs> call me a liberal for that, I will accept. So that's my response. Should we respond <clears throat> to that? Yes. 
no one meant to call you a liberal. I'm sorry if it seemed that way. We were just talking, I was speaking more to something that, um, just watched this documentary um, about James Baldwin. And <clears throat> it's more the case that it seems from that kind of thing that focusing on those kinds of problems is something that a lot of really well-meaning white liberal people have done, you know, and also, also other kinds of well-meaning white people. That's all that was meant to be said about that. <clears throat> um, and yeah, I don't know what to say. It's like, um, I understand that people are really afraid when things, when the status quo gets like torn up, but um, I, I haven't seen the footage that you're talking about. And um, if I've ever been on the streets, like I would have only seen people entering like and seeing black people, you know, entering um entering spaces to liberate and expropriate. Um I don't think that I think that recasting the movement as some kind of like violent um thing that is about murdering people to get stuff is a little sad because clearly there's so many other things going on and clearly so many things that are going on that do look like property destruction that are amplifying the voices of people who can't otherwise be heard very easily or at all. Um, and I mean, I don't know, hopefully it was clear from what we said that, um, you know, people assuming good faith or like assuming um, that it's like, okay, that property is valued over their lives is like really frustrating to people, you know? Um, and that does come in the form of gentrification all the time. Um, that does come in the form of private property. And so people responding to that in whatever way they seem necessary is totally awesome to me. Um, and to us, I think, and I think you would agree with that hopefully. And when you're saying that it's, you know, it is justified. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know. That's kind of like all I have to say about that. I'm just a little, I don't want to derail the conversation too much into talking about property anymore. Like it seems like maybe we can shift back to some of the other things that are more relevant to a conversation about necropolitics for all of us, you know? Yeah. Cause like having, we could have a basic conversation about property destruction and stuff, but maybe that's not what we're here for. Yeah, no, we don't need to have that discussion. I think we agree on, on, on property mm -hmm. and, and what that means. But like I said, it was, I was only trying to enumerate the various kinds of necropolitical activities that we were going to have to confront. And like I said, uh, where you can see the video is on Fox News because they have more than one, more than one person was murdered. And they had it for a while just on a permanent loop, right, to try and discredit the protests. And, uh, you know, again, I agree and I, and I hope that, you know, I explicitly said one of the very good things about this time around that say didn't happen in Ferguson is I think the vast majority of people have separated the property damage from the actual protest, right? That the, they understand that <laughs> what's happening with the protesters is not necessarily an integral part of the property. The other, the other important thing is, and this is one of the reasons I, property destruction is important, is spectacle isn't free. If you want to get into the realm of visibility, you do have to shake up those liberals and others, and especially the conservatives, that do think property is such an important, that you know property is the very key to social order and social dynamics. Right? I mean, that's what neoliberalism is all about. So in order to get visibility, in order to make the cause known, property damage is um, <laughs> not only necessary, it's inevitable. It has to happen. So back to you, Luis. Someone else wants to jump in? I was, I was, um, I was struck by the question of, the, of, the, of making visible things when uh, when you, Steve, talk about how clear 
the video of the of the killing of George Floyd was, and uh, I, I was thinking in the how uh, little kids see the coronavirus crisis as something as a as a kind of invisible threat. And I, I was I'm curious to hear what, what you what you have to say about this. And I think there is this that image that curve we, we've been we hear every day in the news that there is a curve that's a math, mathematical thing that needs to be dealt with. But uh, of course, a mathematical curve is a very poor uh, image of a very complex thing. So I think. I mean, you brought the, those two things together. One that is very, very visible. It's very obvious a video that it's so explicit and so painful compared with the situation in which, I don't know if it's a matter of a scale, because it's not that the, that the virus is invisible, it's just that it's very small, or it's a matter of language and visibility. I was saying that as a provocation for you all. But you can talk about something that's also for sure. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, to, 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 no, I'm not going to work in a, in a, in a affirmative way. Um, <laughs> and yeah, about this uh, visible and invisible, I think that is precisely you know, uh, the one of the most interesting points, or at least to me is uh, how to make it visible or how it remains invisible uh, precisely in terms, yes, sometimes in terms or because of the scale, but sometimes also because of the systems in terms of violence that are operating there. You know? Sometimes uh, the most explicit violence is something, let's say, clear, and but there's such a, a huge amount of uh, tactics, effective tactics to, to practice this uh, extreme violence, but with different temporalities, with, di with different layers, with different visual regimes as well. No? For example, how some fictions operate, no? some perverse fictions with hyper-real consequences, even if they are fictions. So I think that this, uh, how to make it visible or invisible, or for example, I don't know, I am thinking of uh, Robertina's project, Robertina Sergianic, uh, on aqua forensics and this uh, presence of these invisible, let's say, monsters, the impact that we have in the oceans as a polluting agent in terms of uh, chemistry. And I think that this kind of, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, different scales, but also you know, even Mary's uh, project on open source history yeah. team and different ways of, let's say, a slow violence, but uh, is as, as, as uh, tough and, and is violent. So uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm making it clear, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Want to say that? You want to add something? No, no. Just to know if maybe we have some questions or hmm. some feedback from <laughs> <laughs> Is there time for people watching to ask questions? <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, we can have some questions. Yeah. What we could do, I mean, if uh, people from other working groups, the other three working groups, if you want to jump in, you know, you know, the, you have the link of the Jitsi, so feel free to uh, to um, to enter the room. And also, I'm I'm still attentive in the riot chat. So if someone wants to comment or a, or a, or make a question, like I, I will read it. To you. Otherwise, 
That's way to put it. Well, I guess just to fill the space for now, um, <clears throat> it's an interesting point that you brought up and also talking about it in terms of visibility and invisibility and like bringing it back to also, you know, like what we were talking about with uh, the media having different, I don't know, like Steve brought up, you know, like Fox News, which is like, I don't know why we're citing Fox News. It's like a propaganda machine that's like owned by people with special interests, you know, but like there are different sides of the story and different things that get discussed, you know, as with everything. And I think like, it is interesting to think about how we can, yeah, lift up those kinds of stories that are, you know, often invisibilized or, um, I don't know, not seen as <clears throat> relevant or, not, or pain that isn't seen as relevant or death that isn't seen as relevant. Um, what it what it means to really push for that, um, yeah. That's, that's a question, I guess. Yeah, I think one one of the points that we discussed during our debates was that um, you know at some point we we're discussing, and I think is is the material is is available about all these statistics of deaths that you know all these things uh, that are happening as consequence of, you know, um, political decisions and, and you know, they, they, they can cause directly deaths maybe in other countries or to, to given uh, social classes. And, and, and this is all invisible. And I think is, um, I mean, they are made visible when it's interesting for the system to, to achieve something. No, like like before starting a war, they start to show you know how many people is dying in that country because of whatever reason, just to justify uh, an action. So I think is we live in a in the society now where in principle we have access to all information, but it's not true. Uh, we are you know um, swimming in a sea of, of of data, but but it's really I mean this. It's really difficult sometimes to to visibilize uh, to make visible the things if it's not of interest of of who has the power. I mean, yeah, I think that it's super interesting that point, uh, Tony. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, who has the power and how are we participating of these power relationships? No, not just this kind of. Uh, um, protesters like uh, this kind of a transcendental oh. something, <laughs> but uh, also how we are in a way at the same time participating no, of this in between at the same time mm -hmm. in terms of protesters yeah. and potential and something that it's uh, uh, directly related to politics as, as usual and this kind of for example this kind of a project that we were uh reference referring to before uh, such as the prototipome or mary's or ryan hammond's projects or or your projects as well in terms of uh, okay we are also uh, i mean part of this uh uh system in different layers wow. with different responsibilities so i think that when we were thinking you know, during our debate discussions like sharing ideas and concerns uh this uh, notion of uh, if it's possible to think of at least to think of uh let's say new alliances in the space of necropolitics precisely in terms of responsibility uh, paying attention to the material conditions of not just uh, knowledge production, but uh, to the material conditions of uh, some uh, decisions, also in terms of ethical decisions. Mm -hmm. if, if we want to address uh, death and sovereignty and how to manage death, and of mm -hmm. course, uh, for example, something that uh, you will have, uh, I'm thinking of projects such as uh, the Uncle Girls, for mm -hmm. example. So I think that we are enmeshed here mm -hmm. now and thinking of a question that Steve was sharing about uh, what is the new criteria for acceptability. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that... 
there's something there, right? This uh -huh. kind of uh, practices, for example, that view the power message uh, at uh -huh. Kin uh, Lab, uh, the critical important symbol, also, for example, the, the experience and, and that Tony has as a researcher working in a biomedical institution and the things that happens in Angar, in the wet lab and in some other places, uh, uh, networks of uh, what I would say, I, I would describe, I'm sorry if I'm wrong, uh, as a kind of uh, disruptive uh, um, notes, such as Hyteria, for uh -huh. example. I think that, um, are tactics in order to 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 play in an affirmative way in political terms, in ethical terms, in ontological terms, and in and the, and and, and, and <laughs> in epistemological terms uh, on possible ways in terms of strategies to be in this in between, making visible and invisible uh, what. I mean, systemic violences that sometimes are not so explicit, for example, right? So, that's best. Yeah, I, I, I think you mentioned this, um, like art as a, as a way to, I think it has a power. The artists, I mean, maybe there are smaller groups and so on, but the art, I think, can, can have the power to convey, you know, a message and, and make it spread uh, more than uh, you know many many other things. So I think you know that's that's one of these alliances that that we could look for. And the other thing, and I think it was exemplified very well by PMS, is is research. You no, know? like bringing uh, these uh, facts and data to the surface. You no, know? like okay, this is how the system is is you know in the end the bias can can be uh, made visible. Uh, with appropriate research and 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 you know uh, put the data on the face of of the people. So I think these these are important aspects that even if we don't have the power of you know television or whatever, maybe a a, a good small video of, uh, by an artist that you know can uh, send a message very directly and and directly to the, make the people think about one concept. I think that can be very powerful. Mm. Yeah, this is yeah. Please go on. No, I mean, I will not add anything more than what is what has already been said, but I mean, um, visible and invisible, uh, it's, it's precisely the power key with which um, destructivist society we live in uh, function or can survive, no? Um, uh, let's think at work, for instance, or uh, to give an example, uh, a, a cup, uh, one month ago, um, cleaners of hospitals break out, no? Saying we are here too, not just doctors that are, that have became um, heroes, no? Also in the rhetoric way. Um, and, and, and these cleaners have very visible injuries, for instance, hands burned by the chem chemical products, no? for instance. So how to break this boundary between visibility and invisibility is, I think, the, 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 um, the, uh, the, the how you say, the, um, our our fight, no. And from my experience, um, um, I think we have to work both on, uh, let's call, uh, um, commoning practices where we redesign, redefine the our collective values, no. Uh, by building some sort of radical pedagogies in order to detox from what has in what we have um, interiorized and also as Tonya was saying being able no to show data to to make visible our new discoverings and on the other side just thinking uh, at um, Amalia Perez Corospo which uh, probably a couple of weeks ago probably one month ago went to the La Camera de los Deputados um, to the to the government and um, and, and she was so intervening in the public sphere, so in, in, into the power system, by proposing specific um, um, 
shock politics, like shock politics that governments must to put um, very quickly uh, in order to, um, let's say, bring care at the center in order to promote uh, transition no? from uh, an economy, an extractive economy to toward a, a care, a more care economy. So I think we, we need to move uh, as uh, people, as community in different levels, uh, the, the effective one, let's say, and then also the, the, um, in, the internal one, how to um, how to restructure ourselves in order to recenter priorities, to recenter our common values, and uh, uh, to break this uh, uh, invisible, uh, <laughs> let's say, boundary between visible and invisible. Oh, I think there was a lot of really great things in what you just said. Also, I wanted to say, like. Uh, um, on the point of, you know, like we can look to art as a resource or research or this kind of thing. I will say that like one thing that's really good at making things visible apparently is burning down your local abandoned police precinct. So there's that too. Um, but anyway, um, what you were just saying, uh, Madhu, about the chemical burns on the hands, uh, speaking also of things that are invisible to us, uh, here at the Northwest Detention Center where ICE detainees are held, right, um, for being, uh, I mean, they're political prisoners, right, like being held there um, because they do, they're in certain places that don't fall in line with these borders that have been fabricated, despite many of them being from Mexico or indigenous people from South America who have been here a lot longer than those borders have been here, but that's besides the point. Um, they, we, we, uh, some people got to listen to, uh, people, they had a megaphone or a speaker with someone who was on the phone from inside, um, which I think is also a very good tactic for making the invisible visible. And, um, we were, we were learning that on the inside, uh, people are forced to, um, disinfect, uh, and keep clean their own spaces like under COVID right now and people can volunteer to do this for like the shared bathrooms and things like this and people don't have the proper equipment or anything like that and so have these chemical burns as well um and and the chemicals that are being used are chemicals that are not safe for humans like it says so on the yeah anyway and there's not proper ventilation so people are suffering respiratory conditions just from the chemicals <sighs> So I just wanted to bring that up, as you mentioned, the hospital workers or the cleaners, the burns in their hands. There's also some ICE detainees suffering the same thing right now. There is a question in the trial by Tetilia Vilka, but I don't know, someone entered the GTC. I don't know if you're there, Tetilia. Yes, yes I am okay. here. Okay. Go on, please. Uh, well, I was thinking about uh, invisible and um, visible, as you said. Uh, well, I was thinking only related to this uh, racism in you were talking before in America is uh, this thing to make visible some things. For example, in the case of racism, uh, when when we saw this case in USA, people said, "Oh, this is awful." But here, uh, inside our country, is there are a lot of racism. But you can defend this is if is uh, outside, no? Because if you recognize, uh, if you defend yourself, you need to recognize uh, you are not white. So uh, people here, we are the majority that we are not white, but people try to. Uh, use being invisible to as a as a defense, no. So I think I was thinking that sometimes it's not so. What it's really difficult to access to access, for example, of political uh, public political uh, systems or, or things if you don't recognize. Uh, for example, now you are you are. Uh, 
uh, you also are victim of racism, for example, no? So sometimes invisible or visible are not so so simple, no? Or yeah, it's not a, a an answer. It's only a, a thing that I was thinking, no? That is com complex, no? Yeah. <laughs> thank you, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it's great to see you here and to have you here with us. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, we would just, uh, you know, like add something else, and and then Luis, if if if, if you agree, uh, maybe we can also take some questions from the chat and from the ones who have been listening to us for a long time right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh we were talking about also you know in this making visible and invisible uh um i mean if we also think of necropolitics and the related issues problems or matrix, uh, controversial issues beyond the human exceptionalism and beyond beyond I know that sometimes it's almost an oxymoron, but okay, let's say beyond an anthropocentric uh, perspective. Uh, we were thinking of precisely to to deal with this kind of contradictions, no? like using uh, visible and, and invisible, but uh, and maintaining this optic centrism. No? So there's something there at least, I mean, uh, with the kind of practices that a lot of uh, not artists, researchers, people doing things, because uh, I think that one of the most interesting things of the kind of projects that are um, related in a way uh, with biofriction, and I'm not not referring to biofriction just in its um, let's say institutional framework or way, but as a multiplicity of entanglements. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, it's completely different, no? what we were mentioning before, uh, if we try to shift from also from this optic centrism to, for example, an active listening, no? the kind of uh, political issues that are uh, happening there with, for example, not, uh, maybe not something uh, visible or not with uh, some... Mm, layers of visibility but for example with some sonic agencies or agents you know what happened for example when we have a, an experience in an active way in terms of listening of the very low frequencies no so we were just yeah. wanted yeah. to yeah. mention it. that's it <laughs> i cannot resist to comment on one thing that uh that Tony, you, you said about art, because this is something that worries us a lot in Angara, and we work with this a lot. It's, I think I think you're right with what you say, that of course art can be a, a very effective loudspeaker of a message. But this is not necessarily a good thing. I mean, I, I, uh, I'm very depressed with the musical experience, with the mainstream musical experience during the lockdown. Because we, we witnessed it, a lot of very lame songs saying, hey, stay at home, behave, be nice. And those those songs are are so depressing for two reasons. Why? Because one reason is that that's happy. <laughs> so they're meant to, to hide the anxiety that we all have during this very strange situation. But then also the message. It's so, I mean, it's... Even if we decided, hey, it's important that we stay home. Um, I mean, it's 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 so lame as the message of a song, and and of course, and and we witness a, a huge celebration in the media. Oh, look how how important is art? <laughs> that was the argument. You see how important is art? It's very useful. So people behave. So I'm quite I'm quite impressed with that. And um, so. Of course, art has this power. But it's very important that art has also the, the, the power of questioning the language, the terms of the of the of the discussion. And sometimes we need to uh, we need to uh, to um, deny the, that that power of communication that art uh, 
us in order to gain our another kind of artistic power. Yeah, so I I agree totally with you. I think yeah, art we can see art as a tool and it can be used, you know, in one direction or, or the other. That's that's usually the problem with with the yeah. tools, and I agree totally with what you say about the, the music <laughs> uh, arena during this crisis. So one thing uh, I think is important also about invisibility and visibility, I think is is that human nature is like we, we get habituated to things, no? We, we have this habituation. So many things are, you know, in front of us and, and visible, but people doesn't see them because it's kind of, habituated to, to the circumstances. And I think this happens with racism and, and, and many things that are so part of the system that people knows that this happens, but it's, it's kind of, it's not aware uh, in a conscious uh, manner. So I think that's, that's one problem for making things visible. Uh, and another problem I think is, is uh, again linked to, to how we are humans is, is this, uh, it's, it's called uh, this confirmation bias. You know, when, when there is a lot of information available, uh, people tend to to play at, pay attention to the information that confirms what they were already thinking, and I think we are. Uh, that's also making it difficult to break some barriers. No, like people that has one type of thinking, uh, even if you show uh, or if there is some information that that could get to them, they won't never find it because they will, you know, go to the other side or they will think, okay, this is this is not uh, real or I don't believe it or you know, it's it's very hard. To, to make things visible, I think. I just want to say that on this, um, a lot of necropolitics is how to make it accessible, right? It's not, and, and while we've talked a great deal about how the policy is late and, and um, there's, there's an accessibility question. And Tony, this is where I think you're really right, is that art can do a lot. Because if we look at some of these languages, whether it's the medical language or the language of insurance or the language of wildlife management, they are these really technical, numerically oriented, complicated language that just makes people go blank the minute that they lay their eyes on it. And this is you know, where art can have a real translatable uh, kind of effect where it can get through this, get those ideas, and then put them into another form that is accessible, right? I mean, you know, as we've talked on this so many times that we have a real language problem. And, and that's part of it is, you know, that we, we don't have the words. And, and here we are, I, I think, as artists, as, as my fellow artists here, are trying to work on that right now. How do, how do we make this clear? How do we frame the questions right? And if we can even get to that, um, then we can start working on serious answers. But do I think art can act as an avant-garde in, in this enterprise? Yes, I, I do. And, uh, I, you know, because artists are pretty good at inventing narratives, of inventing languages, and inventing the images and the mythologies that we need to change the current, to change the status quo. So on my more optimistic days, which I don't have many, um, <laughs> I, I'm often willing to give art the thumbs up. It, it, it is a ray of hope. <laughs> Over to you, Luis. I think this moment, I mean, just forget about me. Just jump in, whoever wants to say something. To this, it's really late, it's almost 10, but, uh, but I don't know. I mean, feel free to keep talking. Just want to. I'm. I'm more thinking. Uh, not that, but I have some questions about uh, this particular consideration about the, the notion of art, especially in Western culture. Uh, because we study a bit about the meaning of art. It was like a pre-modern notion used by witches. It was before colonization. It was before, uh, yeah, uh, which is uh, hunting. Witch. Yeah, witch hunting. Witch hunting. 
So it was very with the beginning of uh, modern uh, Western thinking and with the creation of disciplines, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. disciplines, uh, with the specialization between a lot of practices and knowledge. Um, and um, the beginning of university. Hmm? Well, so arts and science and a lot of uh, terms and kind of producing knowledge, mentality of producing knowledge in uh, modern Western thinking is quite recent. Uh, before arts was very transdisciplinary way of to produce knowledge and in i think in our modern uh, context arts is more about what is not all the other disciplines no? so it's not only about aesthetics about uh, doing pretty things and to do like uh, communication but it's also about investigation research and uh, it's like an open space in this kind of closed and separated space, no? For me, arts is not about, uh, yeah, aesthetics. It's more about a space that escapes to this, not escape because it's within, mm. but that was put like in a garage. You can do what you, do, what you want because it's only art and you can, yeah, it's only art, you know? So, but. For example, when we were working in these projects that we presented before, we were working in uh, Park de Rocher and Park uh, PLBB, mm. uh, Biomedical Research Park. So we learned a lot about how to deal with cell culture, human cell culture. But we are not able, uh, we were not able in this space to make uh, experimentation in our own bodies, no? To say, okay, we will grows our own cells, our own tissues, and we will experiment on this. And this we can do it in an art space, no? Uh, because it's, it's art. It's like uh, non-legal, not, it's not illegal. It's not defined, no? Art, it's like this. Illegal. Right. Illegal, <laughs> strange space. And uh, I think art is also a tool right now to maybe not it's not against a specialization because we can learn a lot about this, but it's about connect again a lot of specialization disciplines to work together. It's maybe to make a mix between this situation before and this situation we are now. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to add to that, like, certainly having the ability and privilege to, like, say that I'm just doing something as art has, like, kept me out of prison before, you know, um, so that's true. But I think also, like, on this question of visibility and invisibility, one thing that might be interesting to bring up is just that, you know, there is also sometimes benefits to being invisible and not making your actions visible, especially when we live in a world where, you know, in for the most part, like taking care of one another's health and taking care of one another in very basic ways is, is very criminalized. Um, and there's many different ways in which, you know, um, standing up against different kinds of violence and brutalities um, will only meet you with, with um, other violence and brutalities from the state or from other kinds of institutions. I think trying to find out ways that you can remain invisible to those entities while being, you know, visible to one another um, in those struggles is also crucial. Um, and, and I think uh, that's something to think about too. Like maybe we don't all have the ability to, um, for example, be in a conversation like this or have the ability to um, be labeled as an artist because of our education or standing, right? So like, yeah, how do we how do we bridge those gaps? Maybe is an interesting question too. Thanks. Someone want to comment on that?
Mm, well, I think that's, um, it's, it's, I was about to say that it's really important, but I think that it's crucial, no? But um, power makes us sick, just as they mentioned. I mean, uh, also, for example, taking into account one of the questions that we were sharing here about the new criteria, no? So how, um, who, who is allowed to, to articulate this new criteria? No, who is going to, to have access to, to participate in this process? No? So I think that uh, in that sense, uh, at least yes. it seems to me a crucial question. Um, perhaps, I mean, of course we can continue. And uh, if someone, if, if, uh, if someone uh, has the feeling that wants to still add something, please do it. But um, perhaps I, I sense that the energy are running a bit low. We've been here for two hours, and it's, uh, it's a bit late. So I would I would suggest that of course this is something that will continue. So this is just a presentation, and everyone in following from the streaming from Brian and from here is connected. The next presentation is on is on Wednesday, so it's it's really close. The, the, that will be the Eurosol Nauts uh, group presenting. Of course, we all uh, will be connected. So if you don't mind, if no one objected, I, I would say we can end the session here. Thank you for being so patient and uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, Laura, you want to add something? Someone wants to say? Oh, yeah, uh, uh, well. Uh... I just wanted to say thank you so much to all of you, to, to the ones who have been listening to us uh, in this, uh, let's say, a bit weird Friday evening, nice plan. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, mainly I just want to say thank you because it's been a pleasure, even under the circumstances that uh, probably were not the ideal circumstances because for sure we would no, we would prefer to have in this in person meeting. But uh, yes, yeah, thanks so much for, for, for everything, for making, you know, like uh, debates in plural possible. And, and to all of you for the things that you are doing in the way you are, do, you are doing these projects, things, research, and sharing questions and also material conditions of knowledge production because uh, I mean this let's say um, general framework that uh, it's been called by your friction as I said it has one um, let's say by your friction with capital letters it has uh, <laughs> one institutional dimension but by your friction as a multiplicity of entanglements is thanks to all of you to, to some other note to some other practices and this kind of debate uh, uh, it's, it's are, are possible thanks to, to, to the, the things that you are doing in the, in, the, in the way that you are doing them and thanks to your commitment and kindness and generosity. So I just want to say thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. So Thank you all. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your thoughts and your words. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a nice night. Bye. Bye.